All righty. Good morning, everyone. Um, I know folks are still filtering in, but uh, I'm going to get us started so we can make the most of the hour we have this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first thing in the morning on Wednesday, also the first day of session, so a lot happening today, but thank you for joining us. Um, this is the first in our year-long series of learning. The partnership is really excited to host this series that we've prepared uh, where we focus on a wide range of conversations um, with different advocates and leaders in other sectors to talk about the impact that a lack of safe, affordable housing has on their work and ours. Um, before I get into more information about the partnership and today's topic, I just want to remind you that this series is going to be taking place on the first Wednesday of every month, starting this month, February, and ending in October. Um, if you're sad that there's not something on the calendar for November, do not worry, because that's usually when we host our affordable housing conference. So that's going to be our main focus for learning um, this year at the end of this year. Uh, we are recording today's event, um, and we'll be posting it to our YouTube channel. So if you missed the first minute as you're signing in, um, you can also go back and watch that. If you have folks that you want to watch it later, um, you'll also have access to that. Hopefully within the next week or so, it'll be published. Um, and if you have any questions, please use the chat box feature. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat for folks' questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can with the time that we have allotted today. So. Moving forward, if my slides will move forward, um, I want to first introduce the partnership and why we're hosting this series. So the partnership promotes equitable change in Connecticut housing policy by coordinating advocacy, advancing research, and uniting diverse partners. Our vision is that everyone in Connecticut has a safe, stable home that's affordable to them and an equitable community of their choice. And our mission is carried out through partnerships. We are committed to policies and practices that reduce disparities in housing and within our organization. We ground our work, our work in facts and data, and we prioritize housing solutions that will be affordable and sustainable in the long term. We work to actively create and support an anti-racist, inclusive culture throughout all our work, internally and externally. We're committed to addressing housing policies and practices that perpetuate disparity uh, uh, in housing and within our organization, and we believe housing is a human right. We ground our work in honest, factual, data-driven information that we use to dispel myths, challenge stereotypes, and fill gaps in knowledge to drive narrative, policy, and systems change. And we prioritize housing solutions that will be affordable and sustainable long-term. We focus on the full spectrum of housing needs and experiences of communities now and for generations to come. So how do we realize or actualize our vision? We know that healthy housing system necessitates a comprehensive approach that intertwines housing affordability, creation, choice, and stability. People need to afford their homes while meeting their other basic needs. And we need more physical homes, period. Uh, we need all different types of homes for people to choose from in all communities across our state. And people should have the right to safe, stable homes and supported from the experiences of housing instability, eviction, and homelessness. This is how we weave a housing system that prioritizes the needs of our residents and that supports strong families and strong communities. Um, in particular, today's conversation is going to really focus in on this housing choice bucket. So if you're looking to sort of orient yourself to the conversation, that's really where we're going to be honing in a little bit more today. What you should see here is a word cloud that was generated from our conference this past November in 2023, where we asked attendees to share um, the words or phrases that describe what a thriving community looks like to them. And what you see here is a culmination of about 81 different responses. Um, and really why I'm showing this is because it really speaks to what we're doing here today and shows us that thri a thriving community is inherently intersectional. Um, to define intersectionality, it is a framework for conceptualizing a person, group of people, or a uh, social problem as affected by a number of influences. It takes into account people's overlapping identities and experiences in order to understand the complexity of the experiences that they're facing. When we think about building thriving communities, we need to think beyond just the lack of available housing options. We need to think about the accessibility to food. We need to think about accessibility to clean water, healthcare, green spaces, third spaces as they're sometimes referred to, school systems, services, diversity, anything under the sun really. Nothing exists in a vacuum, especially not housing. And that's really why we're hosting this series. Um, as we think about the intersectionality of the conversation around housing, 
I think it's also really important that we acknowledge it's an inextricable link to the land that we're living on and that we build on. Um, while there's a lot of work for us to do regarding uh, addressing our history and the impact it has left on many families, um, you can start by learning a little bit more about the land you live on. We'll drop a link in the chat to um, nativeland.ca. Uh, they're a great resource for just getting started if you're unfamiliar with the territory, the tribal communities in uh, the area in which you live. Um, and uh, I'll also make sure to drop in a moment um, some specific Connecticut resources if you're looking to learn a little bit more about Connecticut history. So now that you know why we're here, um, I'm really, really excited to introduce you today to SN. I'll let her um, introduce herself a little bit more as she kicks off her presentation. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the intersection of affordable housing and land use. And SN has prepared a really great conversation to introduce us to this topic and provide some more resources for you all um, in case you want to do a little bit more diving into this topic uh, from here. So with that, I will hand it over to you, SN. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Danielle. All right, let me share my screen. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Righty, perfect. Um, so welcome everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be here today. And thank you to Danielle and the partnership for inviting myself and my organization to be a part of this um, series. We're very excited uh, about the opportunity to, to talk about an issue that, that matters a lot to, to all of us. And so as Danielle mentioned, my name is Savannah Nicole Fialba and I go by SN. I'm the Community Planning Director for the Narcotec Valley Council of Governments. And it's great to be here with you all today. This is an overview of what we will cover in today's presentation. I'll first go over what NVCOG is and who we serve. Then we'll briefly reflect upon how I interpret the theme of the series. Third, we'll talk about an intersection between affordable housing and land use. And then finally, we'll end with some calls to action and questions. I have the privilege to work at the Nogatuck Valley Council of Governments, often referred to as NVCOG. NVCOG serves 19 municipalities in West Central Connecticut as their state designated regional council of governments and their federally designated metropolitan planning organization. We are one of nine regional councils of governments in the state and I saw some of my council of government colleagues um, in attendance so so happy to see you here. Um, as a regional council of governments, we work on municipal and regional projects focused on the environment brownfields, transportation, mapping and data, community engagement, land use, and housing. We help our municipalities staff, boards and commissions, um, or other entities with plans, policies, programs, and initiatives. As a metropolitan planning organization, we plan for our region's transportation system and administer state and federal transportation planning funds. A council of governments is different from a municipality in many ways, but I like to highlight the main difference that I see, which is between who we serve. A municipality serves its constituents, whether that be residents, businesses, or property owners. A council of governments serves the municipality. So we work on projects, tasks, or initiatives that the municipality through its chief elected official or its legislative body have requested our service on. I will make a note here today that the views I share are my own and they're not representative of my organization or the municipalities that I serve, um, but I'm thankful that I had the opportunity and they supported me being here today to, to get into this presentation with everyone. Okay, so I spent some time after the partnership invited me to participate in the series thinking about what an intersection meant to me. Um, I think it's kind of silly and apt that the analogy I want to share is transportation related as an urban planner, but I will note that Kimberly Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality, what Danielle was touching upon, came to mind. And I think that the thinking about how different coalitions and aspects of the built environment come together um, still is in that through line. So as we are all aware, our society faces a variety of pressing challenges. Imagine that this image represents each coalition trying to advance outcomes to solve their identified issues. Danielle named a few earlier in the presentation, but for the simplicity's sake, let's identify the yellow car as housing issues, the blue gray car as transportation, and the green car as environmental issues. I know, very original for green for the environment. 
Um, we can also think about this analogy through our own housing coalition. Maybe the yellow car is trying to address homelessness. The blue gray car might be advocating for broad state policies. The green car could be implementers of policy and plans. I think the potential hazard of thinking of intersections in this way is that coalitions, either between coalitions or within a coalition, have short opportunities to engage with one another. Those intersections, those points where those cars may pass in the center of that, that intersection are short, they're brief. Um, maybe we do some of this already. You call your colleague, um, who works in regional government or another municipality or in the advocacy space. Uh, you come together at a conference. You do a brainstorming session every few months. But when we only come together in short touch point ways, we have to ask ourselves, are we traveling in the same direction? Are the priorities we're advocating for as holistic and feasible as they can be? How might focusing on our specific issue, whether within our coalition or within our broader system, um, might further silo us if we're all advancing what we think um, needs to occur, but we're not working together in tandem, there's a danger that we're going to travel in different directions. So I encourage us to think about the power of intersecting through more of a model that looks like this. When different interests travel in the same direction through collaborative action and problem solving, we can share momentum as we work to advance our communities and our state. While our desired policy outcomes might be different, I think everyone in the room wants to see a more resilient, a more inclusive uh, and inviting state. And so we need to all work together to achieve within our coalitions and outside of our coalitions, um, better outcomes for all. And I feel like we're starting to see a ton of great energy that looks more like this model. Uh, I want to shout out the CLCC's Affordable Housing and Environmental Conference that happened last February. I thought that was really interesting and, and a, a great opportunity, as well as the Partnerships Conference. Danielle said the next one's in November. I highly recommend attending. Uh, it always gets my gears turning in my head about how we can connect with one another. I will also say that I'm a firm believer in sustained relationship building. And with that, I just want to thank Sean Gio for at the partnership for the relationship he helped foster between our organizations. Um, we are all aware of how difficult this work can be. And I think that this series can be an opportunity for us to check in, be sure we're heading together forward in the same direction and offer a moment to regroup. And that's what I tried to depict on the right. I made little parking spaces for the cars. Um, I want us to stop, reflect, learn something new, build connections and strengthen ties today. All right, so as I briefly mentioned, there is a ton of great work happening around the intersections of affordable housing and land use. With that, I wanted to try to fill a gap in the work that I, I've identified. Um, there's a lot of great information from a bunch of organizations that highlight big strategies to advance housing goals. I've provided a few examples at the end that we'll briefly touch upon, um, but they're more for further research and review. But today, I hope to shine some light on how to interact with your municipal land use commissions to support, to support sustained awareness and involvement. We need those big actions, but we also need community members to be aware, to engage with the day to day, the week to week, the month to month of what their commissions are doing. Um, this presentation is intended to serve as a high level starting place. If you're interested in learning more about land use processes, uh, you can reach out to myself or I recommend telling the partnership so that they can hopefully facilitate additional opportunities to learn how the, the inner workings of land use processes. And then by the end of this discussion, I hope that attendees will feel more confident to engage and act upon housing goals in land use settings. This will include learning how to find when your community's land use commissions are meeting, know where the meeting is and understand what the meeting is about and how to meaningfully participate in the public process. I like to start discussions by defining key terms to ensure that everybody understands what is meant when we're talking about a specific term today. The first term we'll discuss is land use. I provided a helpful definition from the American Planning Association, but I know that it's long, so I'll break it up into three key parts. Land use relates to development. 
It can include development that has already occurred or proposals for future development. Land use relates to the current or future developments receiving permitting. Generally, most development requires at least some level of municipal review to be built. Today, I'll introduce you to different types of commission level permitting. I won't get into the nitty gritty about each or talk about administrative levels of review. However, that's another area that would be beneficial to discuss in, in a follow-up setting. Finally, land use is regulated. In the state of Connecticut, the adopted comprehensive plan is called the Plan of Conservation and Development. Land development regulations can include zoning regulations, inland wetland regulations, um, septic regulations through your health district, aquifer protection regulations, historic district regulations, um, sewer regulations through your water pollution control authority, just to name a few. Each commission regulation has a local board or commission who administers and enforces the regulations. Local boards and commissions often authorize a municipal staff person to enforce the regulations on their behalf. Our focus today will be planning and zoning commissions. In some communities, they're combined, but I wanna talk about them separately just to make sure that we can be clear about the distinction between the two powers and the different roles that they play. I'll leave the more environmental commissions for another day for another speaker. All righty, so now we're gonna talk about the tools. Both planning and zoning are tools by which land use decisions are made. Planning and zoning are separate tools that are authorized under different sections of the statute. If your goal is to enact change in either, it is really, 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 really important to understand which is which tool and what each tool can or cannot do. Planning is about short, medium, and long-range decision-making to support a community in reaching their implementation and policy goals for the built environment. In Connecticut, our largest planning tool, as I said, is the Plan of Conservation and Development, often referred to as the POCD. The state makes one, regional councils of governments make them, and so do local governments. And everyone's required to adopt or amend a plan every 10 years. What is required in the Plan of Conservation and Development is outlined in Section 8-23 of the General Statutes. I'll also note that most plans, if you look at your municipal plan, do a wonderful job highlighting what's required in a plan in a, a, a much more visually appealing way than the statute does. But these are hyperlinked so that when we share the presentation, you'll be able to click through if that's if you're looking for, for some dense reading material. Um, the Office of Policy and Management at the state keeps an inventory of municipal plans of conservation and development. And so when you do have the presentation, feel free to click it to see where your plan is. You can also find it on your municipal website, but this will show you when the plans are due. Alrighty, so now we'll talk about zoning. Zoning is a tool that allows a municipality to regulate its land through two mechanisms. A municipality that zones creates a zoning map. Generally, a zoning map will categorize areas of a community into different generalized zones or districts. I've included on the slide an example of Hartford's zoning map and then all the different zones and districts that they have. Categories historically were generally broader, so you'd have residential, industrial, or commercial, to name a few. Today, many communities get more specific depending on desired form outcomes, but that's a, a longer conversation than, than we'll have the ability to get into today. And then zoning regulations accompany the zoning map to provide use and form requirements for the districts. The form requirements can relate to the area, so how big a parcel has to be, the bulk requirements, how high is it, how much of the parcel can it take up, the height, how tall can it be, um, design and in specific interest instances. If you have a design district, it might say what colors your signs have to be, um, how much of your facade, so the front of the building has to be glass or things of that nature. Um, and may also cover other aspects such as parking, landscaping, and stormwater management. And I wanna note one more thing. Um, this definition mentions that a program that implements the policies of a general plan. And so you'll see when we talk about how to meaningfully participate, the ways in which the plan of conservation and development 
is a tool that we analyze different zoning mechanisms through. Um, that requirement of consistency is, is something that we'll see. It's that, that review of consistency. It's not required to be consistent, which is a, a different conversation, but it has to be reviewed. The commission has to look at how any zoning change relates to the plan of conservation and development. Alrighty, so now that we've defined some common terms, we'll think about what is needed for that sustained involvement with your local commission. The first thing you'll wanna know is when your commissions meet, and this looks different in every community. I stated earlier, some have combined planning and zoning commissions, some have separate, some meet once a month, some meet twice. So it's really important to pay attention to your specific municipality to understand how your structure works. And you can find a lot of great information on your municipal website. So I'll show you three options on how you can answer this question and we'll start with the, the website. Most municipalities have an upcoming events page or meetings calendar that you can find directly on their homepage. I like to check my calendar because sometimes you can find some interesting events or meetings that you didn't know were happening otherwise. Another location you could look would be on the commission specific webpage. You can often get there by clicking this boards and committees link and then going to the commission that you're looking for. Um, Avon uploaded their meeting schedule directly onto the webpage. You can find them both here, they're hyperlinks. Um, so you could print that out or put the dates on your calendar. And I saw Hiram is in attendance and he's a, a wonderful planner in our, our state that um, I admire and I know others do as well. So I'm not surprised that, that Avon has made it very clear and very easy to identify um, when their meeting schedule is. And then I'll also say, if anyone here is from Waterbury, your next planning commission meeting is February 14th, maybe a Valentine's Day date, uh, and your next zoning commission meeting is February 28th. Alrighty, and so I would encourage everybody to look at their municipal calendar to see if it has this handy notify me button. Not every community has this, but for those who do, I really recommend signing up. This will allow you to receive an email anytime anything is added to the calendar for the boards or commissions you opt in to receiving notifications for. The benefit of doing this is that it doesn't require you to look back at the meeting calendar unless you're looking for a community event or information on a commission that you don't subscribe to. You'll know when every meeting, including special meetings, which do happen, well, not frequently, but a few times a year in most municipal settings. So if you have this notify me option, I really recommend that you attend. And here's another shout out. If you're in Mansfield, your planning and zoning commission meeting is on the 20th. Another way to view when and where your land use commissions are meeting is to visit your municipal clerk's office. The Freedom of Information Act requires municipal land use commissions um, submit a variety of different meeting materials to the clerk's office, including the schedule of their regular meetings, agendas, minutes, and notice of decisions and actions. And then as a former municipal land use employee, this is my favorite option. You can call or visit us. Uh, your land use staff member's name and contact information can be found on your municipal website, and it's usually associated with your land use commission. So if you went to your planning commission, your zoning commission, it'll often say SNVL book, assistant town planner, town planner, and, and you could give them a call or shoot them an email. If you have questions about anything land use related in your municipality, your land use staff are there to serve as a resource. It's their job to understand your regulations, to make sure that they're being interpreted correctly, and to guide community members as they try to navigate those um, regulations. So utilize them. Um, and I also note that some municipalities have one night a week where they work late. If you're unable to call or visit during the day, which is valid, um, not everyone works nine to five, not everybody works schedules or, or have other commitments that make that feasible. And I wanna acknowledge and, and call light to that. Um, you can still email them. You can still call them. If you work during the day and you wanna go in person and your community has that late option, I encourage you to visit. Um, we'd love to see you there. So now you know when the meetings are, but you have to figure out where and what the meetings are about. You can answer both of these questions by reviewing the commission's agenda. We'll start first with where is the meeting. 
The location of a meeting is prominently displayed on the agenda. And it's important to look at this every time because some communities meet in person and some meet virtually. And sometimes depending on the interests that the planner or the commission sees um, for that meeting agenda, the meeting might move. So it would be not great if you went to town or city hall because that's where the meeting always is and the meeting was remote or the meeting moved to the library or the school across town because they wanted to be sure that there was enough room for everybody. So I really recommend checking the agenda's location. And then this is my silly attempt to put a cape on the agenda. Um, the agenda is your key to understanding a land use meeting. It's the superhero of the day, um, as well as the plan of conservation and development. I'll spoil it. I have two superheroes. But it will show you where to go and begin to de demystify the process. So for the purpose of today's discussion, we're going to talk about what could be on agenda by referencing the definitions and tools that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation and we'll get into detail more about now. The powers and responsibilities of a planning commission differ from a zoning commission. Knowing which commission is in charge of each power will help you better understand the processes and will then help you engage deeper. Um, if you know what types of processes can happen under each tool, you'll be better equipped to carefully review the agenda. And agendas will generally give you a short description of what each item is. You can see it here for this is New London to allow the installation of a unified signage program. Um, if you're unsure of which tool that that item fits under, I encourage you to reach out to your land use staff. And you can also reach out to them because if application materials aren't available on the website, they can make those materials available to you. All righty, so now we're gonna get into, we talked about planning. We're gonna talk about the five main powers that a planning commission might be meeting about. And I've tried to hyperlink as much as I can about where you can find information, but also provide a bit of a high level under, um, high level discussion as well. So the first power is working on the plan of conservation and development, which is a long range plan for the community that identifies future growth and conservation policies. We briefly talked about it at the beginning. I provided one example, but there are specific housing related requirements in drafting a plan of conservation and development. I highly recommend if you're not sure what they are, you take a moment and you peek through that section so that you know when you're looking at a planning, a plan of conservation and development draft, if you don't think that it's identified one of those areas, that's the type of comment that, that you should be making and you should be providing. The second thing your planning commission might be working on is what we call an 824 referral. It's not an original name, just based off of the section of the statute that it lives in. This allows a planning commission to weigh in on certain municipal improvements, and they often review these referrals for consistency with the plan of conservation and development. The third power is the administration of subdivisions. Subdivisions are the division of land into three or more lots, primarily used for residential development, the fourth thing your commission might be doing or might have just finished is your municipal affordable housing plan. While this was not expressly designated as a planning task, a lot of planning commissions took the lead in initiating this effort. The fifth main power is that a planning commission has is to review zoning amendments or district proposals for consistency with the plan of conservation and development. I hope you've identified the through line for what a planning commission does. They spend a lot of time looking at things for consistency with the plan. Alrighty, so now we'll talk about what a zoning commission meets about. Zoning commissions spend a bulk of their time reviewing applications. They might review a permit application under the current zoning regulations, which for this example, the Town of Beacon Falls table contents of their zoning regulations would require reviewing Section 11, Article 2, Article 5, Article 6 of the zoning regulations. They might be reviewing applications to modify either the current zoning regulations or the zoning map. That would require reviewing Section 4, 74 of the example provided. Administration and enforcement can include a variety of tax, tasks related to the commission requesting the enforcement officer to review violations, um, or it can include the commission proposing their own tax amendments or zone changes. All righty, so those are the high level tools. Now we're gonna get into how can you meaningfully participate in the process? And we're gonna go through with those tools, 
which ones you can comment on, what you might want to reference as you comment, um, and different strategies that are important to ensure that your comments um, are meaningful and, and get across to the community in an impactful way. The first thing to note is that most communities ask that you state your um, start your comments with your name and your address. If there are any if there are any attorneys in the room or planners that know why that that's asked, I think it has to do with establishing your standing to comment on a public process as a member of the community. Um, if anyone can comment further, please do so in the chat. I'm not sure if it's required. And so this is a little bit of a fuzzy area for me. It's moving less out of land use and more into meeting requirements, um, broadly in the municipality. But this is also why education around interaction with commissions matters so much. We need members of all communities to engage with their local processes um, under the current mechanism that we're working under. Local decisions about housing happen at these community meetings. And if you're not there commenting, um, you're not a part of these processes. You're not participating in the processes. Alrighty, so these, as we talked about, plan of conservation and development, 824 referrals, subdivisions, affordable housing plans, those are the tools. And then we'll talk about if they have a public hearing and then if you can provide public comment. Generally, if there's a public hearing, that means you can have a public comment. If there isn't a public hearing, you can't provide a public comment in front of the commission during the meeting setting, um, but you can often still make, com you can ask questions or make comments to your land use staff um, and they'll decide if it's appropriate or applicable to, to bring in front of the commission. So for the plan of conservation and development, it requires a public hearing and you can provide public comments. The 824 referral does not require a public hearing, cannot make public requirements or public comments. Subdivisions are a little funky. I, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I think that subdivisions and zoning regulations um, deserve their own in-depth workshop. But you can sometimes provide public hearing. If there's sometimes a public hearing, um, a municipality has the option to decide in some instances, and then it's required in others. And then so when it is required, there is a public comment opportunity. Um, if they've decided not to hold them in those optional ways, it, public comment is, is not allowed. And then the affordable housing plan. This was another one of those optional. A community didn't have to hold a public meeting, but if they did and there was public hearing and they allowed for public comment, you could do so. However, um, you should still reach out to your land use staff if you have questions or you don't think something's right or you're questioning the consistency. Um, they're there to talk to you. They're there to talk through these things. And you might say something to the planner or the land use staff or the zoning enforcement officer that maybe they weren't thinking about. So your comments are always appreciated. Um, down here, I've hyperlinked the section of the statute for my friends that, that like dense reading. Oh, oh no, sorry, my apologies. You're seeing, okay. Alrighty, so our superhero cape gets to make one more appearance. If you're looking to provide public comment for a planning matter, the plan of conservation and development is the basis of your comment. The planning and zoning commissions have to review actions for consistency with that plan. You might also choose to reference a municipality's affordable housing plan it is important to note that the requirements for the affordable housing plan do not require commissions to review planning and zoning actions for consistency with the plan. Most do, but they're not required to in the way that the statute's currently written. If you are in one of the communities listed on the photo on the left, your community may have or may be preparing to start your POCD update. I encourage you to attend and participate in those processes. Alrighty, so once you've had your snow day read, your beach day read of your municipality's plan of conservation and development, you're going to be way more equipped to analyze any proposal that requires review of the plan of conservation and development. I've provided two examples of different plans of conservation and development that touch upon housing and, and different ways. But if you're going to provide comments about consistency, 
you want to say things like this proposal is consistent or is not consistent with element, goal, strategy, X, Y, Z, one, two, three, whatever it may be of my municipality's plan of conservation and development. That plan is about balancing interests. And so some people may say, yes, this meets the economic development goals, or yes, this meets the conservation goals, but that might not meet the housing goals. And so we need voices in the room that are holistically looking at proposals so that it encourages commissions to say, hey, how can we modify this so it meets the environmental goals, it meets the economic development, and it doesn't leave out the housing, or it meets the housing and economic development, but it's not considering the environment. We want to work together with our coalitions. Like I said earlier, we want to head in the same direction. Another way you might identify comments for the plan of conservation and development is, is by referencing this proposal meets our population needs identified in the plan by doing X, doing Y. The plans provide a lot of information about your projected population trends, your current community's perception of its needs and facilities, um, and a variety of other very interesting things to get a feel of how your community felt and what your community was looking for the last time the plan of conservation and development was updated. And then the subdivision regulations are more like the zoning regulations in the sense that they define requirements for lot size, orientation, location of buildings, uses, and the like. We don't have enough time to go into the details of subdivision regulations, but a deep dive into both the zoning and the subdivision regulations could be a cool workshop or a um, future opportunity to, to get into the weeds. Um, we can all, I can bring a bunch of scales and we can have a, a wonderful time. Scales and highlighters are the ways you, you use, you review subdivision and zoning plans. All right, so we talked about planning. Now we're gonna talk about zoning. So remember, separate tools, separate statutory sections, separate separate things, separate powers that each are doing. It's really important to think of them that way, even if the commission is combined, because they have different requirements. And so hopefully these slides will help you reference at a later point as well. So we'll talk about the zoning tools we discussed. If the commission is reviewing permit applications that are a site plan, there is not a public hearing and there is no public comment. Those require just that the, the plan and the proposal in front of them be consistent with the zoning regulations. So if you see something that is a site plan and the site plan regulations um, are addressing a, a housing concern, a housing policy, a housing initiative that you think is important, um, that's a place where you could potentially request a modification to the zoning regulations. Um, review permit applications. This one is where it gets a little funky. There are lots of different ways to describe the special use permit, special exception, special exemption. Um, everyone calls it something slightly different, but it's it's around that theme. You'll, you'll know when you see it, it's one of those situations, but you can also call your planner and say, hey, which one is the, the permitting review for zoning that has a public hearing? I wanna be sure that I know what it is. And so that level does have public hearings and it does have public comment opportunities. Same thing with zoning map amendments and zoning text amendments. Alrighty, so if the application is for that special use permit, special exception, or any iteration of how the community defines that, the decisions include consistency with the plan of conservation and development, as well as the zoning regulations um, that have to go through maybe the allowed uses, the area bulk and height standards, the special use permit, special exception requirements, and then the general zoning requirements such as parking, landscaping, roads. With the special exception process, um, sometimes communities have a little bit more of a discretionary ability that's outlined in the zoning regulations. So it's always good to see the discretion that the commission has and the different non like explicit regulations, but more broad considerations they can consider. They can look at traffic impact. Um, they can look at a variety of different things. So it's important to peek around in the zoning regulations. Um, I really, really think that that is an important subject to cover in another meeting, another setting, another time. But rest assured for today that this is really a key role of what your land use staff are doing. 
they are looking at the permit applications for consistency um, with your zoning regulations, with your plan of conservation and development. And some communities even publish their staff reports that identify the ways in which it meets the zoning regulations um, before the meeting. Some post it afterwards. If you're not sure you would like to see the staff report before the meeting or after the meeting, it's another reason to reach out to your local land use staff member. And then I tricked you. Um, the PSCD gets to make one more superhero appearance in the presentation. Um, you can include consistency comments in permit applications, zoning map amendments, and zone changes. So you really do want to touch upon it. It's really important to understand that document. That's that's the, the meat and potatoes of the ways in which your comments can, can identify what the commission is supposed to be making decisions under. I also encourage you to make personal comments. I encourage you to speak about um, what, what speaks to your heart, but this is what binds the commission. This is really where you give them, you show them that you understand. It, it doesn't bind a commission. I wanna be careful how I say that. Um, they have to consider, they don't have to make decisions based on the consistency requirement. But the more people who come out and say that this is consistent because of this, or this isn't consistent because of this, and I want you to change it, you make your elected or appointed officials have to think about how housing plays into this or, or how any other intersection that you're interested in plays into the land use processes. But so you looked at the, the plan of conservation and development, you saw the zone change of the tax amendment, and you go to the meeting and you're prepared and you say it is consistent with the housing goals outlined in the plan of conservation and development because it creates additional opportunities for different housing options. Or you tie it into either a plan of conservation and development requirement or a goal that the plan itself has identified. Um, those are the, the, the meat and potatoes that that push commissioners to, to decisions that um, consider housing, that advance housing. Okay, so this is kind of a broad bit of notes on providing public comment. Um, part of your presentation preparation should be to reach out to the land use staff to see the best way to provide public comment. If you're able to attend the meeting, and again, I, I acknowledge that 6 and 7 p.m. on a work night doesn't work for people who work nights or have families or don't have transportation or don't have access to internet. Um, that's the system that we're in right now, but there are still other ways to participate. Um, but if you can go in person, I really, really recommend that you do. I can say that through my experience, people generally only come out to make comments when they're not in favor of an application. And we need more people like those in the audience today to speak out if you have the time and ability in favor of applications, um, proposing things that advance housing interests. So if you're able to attend in person, you should bring a copy of the comments that you plan to make. It's also a good idea to check with the planner to see if the commission limits the time allowed for public comment. If so, you'll need to tailor your comments to ensure that you don't get cut off in the middle of what you're saying. And one of the goals of today was to equip you so you feel confident and informed to make your comments, no matter how long you speak, you know what to touch upon, um, you know how to really hone in to be sure that your comment counts. And then if you're unable to attend, most communities accept written comments via email or mail, so long as they're provided by a certain time before the meeting. You'll wanna to talk to your land use staff to ensure you know what that cutoff time is for your community to ensure that it gets in front of your commissions. Depending on some communities, some read them directly into the record. They'll sit there and they'll say the whole um, comment you made. Others will acknowledge your seat and they'll share your comments with the commissioners. Both are valid and you can feel confident that your um, comments are being reviewed and that they're part of the record. So please make sure you talk up to your land use staff and either option to be sure that you're prepared, um, whether you go up to the dais, you're at the podium and you're making comments or you're sending that email as a resident of 123 Sesame Street, an approval of an application. All righty, so we're nearing the end of the presentation today. And so um, I some of my team is in the room and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you're here supporting. It, it means a lot. Um, and they know I'm always about the action items. What's next? What can I do? What do I do now? How do I get moving? And so I've got three call to actions to you. 
My first is consider joining a local land use board or commission. If you have the time, if you're passionate about housing, your commissions need you. Your commissions and your community needs people with diverse opinions to participate in these decision-making processes. And I'll also say this, a lot of communities have a lot of land use vacancies. And so if, if, this, if you needed a nudge, if you needed a do it, if you needed a cheerleader, I'm here today to say, do it. If you, you have my contact information, you need me to cartwheel, sing a song, do jumping jacks, whatever it is. Um, we need you, we want your opinions. We, if you can do so um, and it works in your schedule and it's, it's feasible, consider. And then if possible, stay informed with your local land use commissions, meetings and actions. Far too often, um, we only pay attention when there's something you're not sure of or you're scared of or you don't wanna see. Pay attention always. There are always housing applications. There are always little things that are occurring that you can partake in that might help um, a new accessory dwelling unit be built, that might support a new zone change that would reduce barriers to different housing options. You don't know what you don't know. And so it's really important to see what's on that agenda, to check monthly, to check bi-monthly, to try to stay involved as you can. And then consider providing public comment on an application. You can work with your land use staff to make sure your comment um, aligns. You can work together. I saw um, a representative and, and thought leader of the All In chapters in the room. Um, ben, happy to see you here too. But work together, have community meetings, prepare comments together, ask questions about your plan of conservation and development, look at zoning regulations together, review applications. If you have that time and your community is interested in, in playing that sort of active role, it really can go a long way. Alrighty, so what we weren't able to go into super depth about today, but I touched upon is that there's a ton of great big picture land use strategies to advance affordable housing. The partnership had a fabulous presentation during their conference by Jay Klein about Beyond 830G land use tools and strategies to plan for and build homes. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend checking it out. Our regional housing profile includes a variety of strategies to increase affordable housing development. And those are both land use and municipal strategies that highlight education or land use tools to increase housing options. And then the, the Connecticut General Assembly created these commissions on Connecticut's development and future. And one of those working groups was an affordable housing plan working group. And there were a lot of really great and bright minds on that group. So if you haven't seen that plan, it's worth peeking at, it's worth taking a look through. Um, but section seven, menu of land use regulations for review or ways to promote affordable housing units is a great place if you're if you're already ready to go and you want that, you're ready to submit that application, you're ready to take that next step um, beyond just active involvement with your community's land use processes. If you're interested in learning more about land use processes um, in more depth than we were able to go today, you want to get into that nitty gritty. Um, this is a planner's favorite book. Most planners have it. It's a wonderful resource. It, this is the eighth version of it. Michael Ziska is an attorney in the state that um, has made this book for I'm not sure how long, but it is such a resource. Um, it's a little bit dense, but it can be a great resource for a community organization to have um, or an extremely interested um, potential maybe commissioner or community member that wants to understand the processes. And then I'll also say, if you're interested in being a commissioner, you're interested in learning more about um, how land use processes work, our organization put on two full four hour each. So we have eight hours of training that we did in the end of 2023, that if you watch it, you will have the education you need to be able to go to become a commissioner. Um, and the partnership, as I said earlier, partnered with us to help support us in that effort. So again, thank Sean and Chelsea and Danielle and the whole team for, for being willing to help educate um, our constituents and, and our population as well. 
And then two more resources. The town of Windsor has a citizen's guide that I thought was really interesting and wonderful. It's a great resource that you can touch upon um, if you wanna understand how commissions function a little bit more. Um, I wasn't able to review it entirely, so I'm not sure if it's very specific to Windsor, but I still think that there's good information in there, even if it's just to analogize or distinguish from what they do to your community. And then the final thing I wanted to highlight is another, a bit of a dense, but uh, interesting and helpful read is Halloran and Sage's Public Hearing Procedures Pro um, Resource. And that was authored by attorney Mark Brands. And this is authored by what's legally required by attorney Ziska. So I wanna thank them for the, the work that they do. And these are all hyperlinked. So when the presentation gets shared, you'll be able to click through. All righty. Um, with that being said, thank you for your time. Thank you for your um, attention. Thank you for, for being with us on this morning. Does anyone have any questions? You can either put them in the chat or you can unmute. Thank you in the Naugatuck Valley and the All In Project broadcasting live from uh, I-80 in rural Western Pennsylvania. Question, I have a question about accountability, um, specifically about when planning commissions and zoning commissions, or in a lot of our smaller towns combined planning and zoning commissions, make choices that appear not to be consistent with the POCD, um, and that is pointed out by people in a, who, who, you know, residents who come to a meeting, often residents that are part of an all-in organization, um, and the reaction is basically, we're doing it anyway. Um, I recognize the long-term plan is to get some different people on those commissions, which we are, of course, working on. But in the short term, I wanted to know, I know the affordable housing plans don't have any sort of um, recourse in terms of when, when boards and commissions make decisions that are not in line with them. But I'm fuzzier about the POCD. Wanted to know, is there... What, what, if any, recourse is there for a concerned citizen in that kind of situation? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, so that's why I was a, the, the, I don't know if Hiram's still here, but Hiram probably caught some of my um, catching myself as I, I refer to the, the level of requirement that's review in these processes. And so unfortunately, fortunately, I, I won't ascribe a, a, a subjective word like that to it. But the way that it's currently written in the statute is that planning and zoning commissions have to consider. They don't have to, they're not required to make decisions that are consistent with, they have to consider the consistency. And so what you're saying makes sense. Um, there are instances sometimes in which a commission may hear that something is inconsistent. Um, and for whatever reason, as I tried to allude to earlier, maybe they're balancing a different interest, whether it be economic or um, open space or utilities more than they're, they're valuing or they're balancing the housing goals in the plan, um, which is a, a different, it's, a, it's part of the conversation. It's, it's something we need to consider. Um, but they're not required to make decisions that are consistent. And so I think that this is a this is a touch point in which advocates and policy people can speak to implementers about opportunities or spaces where they they could see opportunities to strengthen that requirement. I, I think that could be something that could be considered. Um, in a model that that I'm aware of, and it's the 824 referral process. We'll go back to that for a second. Um, if a planning commission makes a recommendation that that municipal improvement is not consistent with the plan of conservation and development, it forces a supermajority for the legislative body to make a decision about that municipal improvement. There's nothing like that for the planning commission or the zoning commission if there's a decision that it is inconsistent with the plan. Um, that's something that could be considered, but I think that the conversation needs to include implementers. It needs to include the CCAPA, the Connecticut um, 
chapter of the American Planning Association. It should include CASIO, the Connecticut Association of Zoning Enforcement Officers, um, CCM, and then people as well, like the Partnership and Team Inc. Um, and the all-in chapters. We need to broaden how we think about our coalitions. So long answer, that short answer, it's only required to consider. It's not a requirement that it has to be consistent with. Thank you. All righty, so I see a comment from Kathy. Appreciate the call to action. I chair the housing committee on the town's planning and zoning commission with the 1% housing stock. I find what is also needed is providing planning capacity to execute our housing strategies. Much of our strategies goes beyond the scope of a volunteer committee. As a small town, we don't even have a town planner. Wonderful point, Kathy. Um, I'm sorry that, that that's uh, the situation that your community's in. That's tough. And so what I recommend, um, at least for an, an immediate, immediate action that could happen, um, reach out to your chief elected official in your legislative body. See if there's any capacity that your council of governments can provide you. Um, we do see a lot of our communities in our northwest corner and northeast corner um, that, that don't have planners that sometimes rely more heavily on the Council of Government as a model that can provide some of that implementation um, work. And then another thing, depending on where you are, is there are centers for housing opportunity. I work most closely with Jocelyn Ayer of the Litchfield County Center for Housing Opportunity. Her area intersects my region. That's another place where there's capacity. Um, I believe the partnership and the Connecticut project where John Cabral's from um, help facilitate those centers for housing opportunity as well. So try your council of governments, try your center for housing opportunity if you have one. If you don't like my region, call me, but we're working on trying to get one. So um, reach out to your, um, reach out to the Department of Housing, Re tell the partnership, tell John Cabral, tell the Housing Collective, tell people you want one. That's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, alrighty, any other questions? I, I, don't, I know we're hitting the end of time, Danielle, so I, I'll pass it back over um, to you, but Great. Yeah. And actually, um, I just have like one or two more slides that I'll share with folks. You know, we're hitting the end of the hour here. Um, but let me just make sure I have the correct slide show up. Um, and I'm not seeing it. Well, most importantly, thank you, SN. This was an awesome presentation. Um, like you said earlier, we'll make sure all of the links that we mentioned and all of the resources we shared are available. Um, we'll work to get this up on our YouTube channel in the next week or so um, and make sure that you all have access to this. Thank you, Chelsea, for pulling that up. Um, here's our contact information. If you need to reach the partnership, like SN said, if there's other conversations you want to see us have, if there's questions you have about how you can join into the conversation and support um, this great work, uh, you can reach out to myself. You can also reach out directly to SN if you have questions particular to the conversation she brought here today. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll also drop the link in the chat for folks, but we are hosting a um, a webinar again. Like I said, each uh, the first Wednesday of every month, our next conversation is going to be on the intersections of affordable and fair housing with the Connecticut Fair Housing Center. Um, and hopefully the Connecticut Tenants Union, we're still working to see if they're available for the conversation, but they will be a part of the conversation regardless. Um, and uh, again, that'll be March 6th at 10 a.m. Um, so we're really looking forward to having you all here for this conversation as it continues throughout the year. And again, plug in where uh, you have thoughts on other ideas for intersectional conversations we could have. We always want to bring more people to the conversation of housing. Um, it's so important to all of us. So I really appreciate you all being here with us this morning. Again, reach out if anything comes up or you have thoughts after this. Um, and we look forward to engaging you in more conversations in the months to come. Thank you again, SN, and thanks all for joining us.